Good afternoon and welcome to CQL's presentation on a working and effective human rights committee. I have every confidence that it can be done and your organization can do it. And your participation in this call is a good first step in making it happen for you uh, and for your organization. My name is Kathy Adamick and I'm the director of the personal outcome measures at CQL. Mike Clausen is on the call to help me with any technical issues. He'll be monitoring the um, chat and question box that you can use to, um, we prefer that you ask questions in the question box, but if you have um, something simple and um, we can um, respond to it in the chat box, that works for us. Um, this webinar will um, be released as a recording after it's finished with a copy of the um, PowerPoint slides and you'll be able to download that from the link we send to you for participating. Um, in the recorded version, we will have an option for closed captioning. Um, so we are asking that you give us two to three weeks after the um, webinar is complete to get that all up to, um, to so that it's effective for you. Um, if you have any questions, um, please type those in the question box. It is um, just an hour long and we may or may not have time for questions. My email address will, address will be um, available at the end. If you have any questions, I'm happy to ask, answer those by email for you. So welcome to today's presentation and um, let's get started. So today we're going to talk about what is a human rights committee? Why is it important to your organization? Who, who could you invite? Who could be on the human rights committee? Who's the membership? Talk, we'll talk about how the um, human rights committee works and what are some strategies you can do to avoid becoming what we call a rubber stamp human rights committee. At the end, we'll have some, um, the source of some of our information and some resources that we'll share with you um, for your future um, learning. So really, um, the important thing to remember about um, a human rights committee is that it's really based on um, a very strong set of core values and it's based on the basics in that we believe that all people have rights, that no right can be limited without due process, and that all rights have associated responsibilities. It's also very important to think about how we can support people who may have limited life experiences or opportunities to really learn about their rights and how to exercise their rights responsibly. So just to um, demonstrate the importance of this, I think it's, uh, we'll tie it a little bit to the home and community-based settings rule in the um, in the United States, although anything that we say about the home and community-based settings rule would also be the, very similar to the, the kinds of things that you would find in the basic assurances in a person-centered culture, or if using the personal outcome measures. So. In um, the United States, the settings rule really clearly defines that people receiving services through the home and community-based waiver program have the same human and civil rights uh, that people without disabilities have. And that would be true of the basic assurances and of any um, mission and vision of a real person-centered, uh, cultured organization. The, um, the settings rule is also aimed at really supporting people to live the same lives as people without disabilities. It recognizes the uniqueness of each individual and the importance of individualizing and personalizing supports for each person. It does, and as do the basic assurances and again, um, 
organizations that have a person-centered culture recognize that at times people's rights may be limited on a temporary basis. And I think it's the temporary that really is important to think about. And when rights are limited, it really needs to be based on a, an individual specific specified need. So it's not because the person has a disability. It's not because they live in, an, um, in a certain kind of setting. It's not for any other reason than that they have a very specific personal need. It's also very important that if any rights are to be limited, that you really have tried some more positive intervention prior to making those modifications to people's rights. So say that I have, um, um, I have a right to have visitors in my home, but that I have demonstrated um, some poor decision making with some of my choices and it's caused problems for myself and for other people um, that I live with. So the first step would really be to think about what are those positive things that you can do to help me learn about um, what, what choices I could make and the impact of my choices before you limit and say, um, absolutely, you can no longer have visitors. And then, that, th then we have to document that, that, it's, that we've tried those things and they didn't work. The, the, um, the intervention should also be clearly described and directly proportionate to the specific assessed need. So I just said, I, you know, I sometimes make bad decisions and invite people to visit at my home. Well, that wouldn't necessarily result in a ban of all visitors. It might just result in a ban of visitors that I don't know. So I, my rights may be limited in that respect, but people who, with whom I have an established relationship, people with whom um, my family, my supporters, my friends that I've had wouldn't be limited. And so really, again, make sure that the right, is, the right limitation is very specific to my need, which is that I sometimes make bad decisions when I meet pe new people. It should um, include a regular collection and review of data to, so that we can see if it's effective, um, see if we need to make modifications or changes to it. Um, we need to establish timelines for regular and periodic reviews. And it needs to have the informed consent. It needs to have my informed consent and I need to understand it um, also in the same way that my, um, if I have an, a, an alternate decision maker or someone who supports me with decision making. The other thing is that it really has to, we have to make sure that the restriction will do no harm, that any intervention and support will do no harm. And so when we think about doing no harm, and I go back to the example of visitors, you might think about, you know, if we limited my, um, my ability to have visitors or my right to have visitors of people who are a positive influence on my life, that that may be problematic. Um, and so it really is, it may actually do more harm. There's also a lot of um, research and a lot of information on trauma-informed supports that really applies here as well. Um, but I don't want to get too off track with trauma-informed. That's a very important topic and something that um, you need to consider for people who have a history of being, um, of experiencing trauma in their life. The Human Rights Committee is a group of volunteers that are really committed and interested in protecting and promoting people's rights, their human rights, their civil rights, their legal rights. And the Human Rights Committee functions as an advisory board to the executive director, the chief um, executive officer, the CEO, whoever that is that's in that um, leadership role. And really a part of what they do, um, the major part of what they do is to ensure that people's rights are protected. And they act as a resource 
for people who receive supports and for their supporters or their teams. And so they might help them to come up with questions that they might ask if the doctor is recommending certain things. What are other choices? So if, if the doctor is recommending a, um, a, a limited diet because of cholesterol, it might be that the team talks about that there's medications that you can take or that um, there are just some foods that you can avoid um, without having to be on a restricted um, calorie count. So, you know, what are those options? So they might help teams think through those things. They also really are actively promoting the exercise of rights by people. Um, and they share information with the organization with the intent to improve the quality of life for the people that receive services through that organization. Why would you have a human rights committee? Well, in the United States, there are in the HCBS, the waiver funded um, settings regulation and the intermediate care um, facility regulations, there are federal laws. There are also some state statutes or um, regulations that require them. Outside of the United States, there may be other reasons, but it also meets the expectations of CQL's basic assurances. So organizations who are accredited or who are using the personal outcome measures uh, would want to have a human rights committee to meet some of those kinds of things, but it's also best practice. And so in a person centered culture, it's a uh, organization, it's a best practice on that really focuses on promoting and protecting the rights of people who may have limited life experiences or supports. So when we talk about a rubber stamp committee, what is that that we're referring to? Well, frequently when we see rubber, uh, rubber stamp committee, and this would be based on our experience with doing um, accreditation reviews using the basic assurances or in our conversations with, um, with folks while we do personal outcome measures training. What we find uh, are typically some characteristics of committees that tend to rubber stamp are where the members haven't received training on their roles or their responsibilities. So they really don't know what they're doing. They haven't been told and don't understand what they're supposed to do. Or we find that the executive director is the chairperson when really the, exec the human rights committee is serving as an advisor to the executive director. So there's kind of an inherent conflict of interest when the executive director is the, is the chairperson. One of the other things we find is that when people are not invited to meetings to talk about their restrictions, to share their viewpoint or their part to a um, impartial group of people, we find that those are typically organizations who are um, rubber stamping. We also find that one of the problems that leads to rubber stamping is that people have a large number of restrictions that they review at each meeting. Sometimes this may be uh, many people with um, just a few restrictions, or it might be some um, a few people with many restrictions. But if you think about it in terms of how long your meeting lasts, and so if your meeting lasts two hours, and you are looking at a total of maybe 40 to 45 restrictions, you really only have two and a half to three minutes to talk about each of those restrictions. And you have to think about, is that enough time? So when you're planning your agenda, of course you wanna look at, um, um, is it a reasonable number of restrictions or a reasonable number of things that the, the committee is looking at? What we also find is that there's no statement or policy that, that clearly defines the role of the Human Rights Committee. So there's really no guiding principle. There's nothing that, from that organization. And that links back to the organization not having training or not understanding their role and responsibility. 
we find that um, whether this is a cause or a symptom, we don't know, but we find that the human, if a human rights committee rarely ask for more information, rarely ask questions about why is this restriction necessary, that we find they are much more likely to rubber stamp. Another sign of a rubber stamping committee is that almost all or every restriction is approved and that the minutes or there's little um, discussion among the members that's recorded and kept for, um, for in record keeping. So those are some um, symptoms of things that we find as well as, um, you know, the Human Rights Committee sometimes are very hesitant to be critical of you, the organization staff. They know that people work hard. We know, they know that the staff have been trained and that they're professionals and that they might feel like the professionals really know what's best. Or they might think really people with disabilities, they need these restrictions for their own protection. Um, so those are some of the things that we, that we see. So when we think about how do we avoid those things, we start with membership. The, the more diverse your membership is, the, the, the more likely there are to be people from many different walks of life that are willing to actively participate and ask questions. We find that there should be at least two people who receive services who are on the committee. Sometimes that means that only one of them can come, but, but that you have an alternate in that way. The other thing, again, with the training is around mentoring. So we know that not every human rights committee member comes in at the exact same time. So how is it, you know, can you develop some mentoring strategy to make sure that people, each person, understands and, and is able to be an active participating member? That might mean that um, someone meets with them ahead of time to go over what's being talked about. It might mean that they debrief for a few minutes after the meeting, um, you know, with a phone call or something, but it, providing mentoring, having other members of the Human Rights Committee being um, on the committee, uh, uh, mentoring someone that's new to the committee. It's very, very helpful if you have a couple of people, at least one or two, that are really knowledgeable about psychotropic medications. I have found that some of the most effective human rights committee, and when I was on a, a human rights committee um, many years ago, we had a very involved pharmacist who would, um, because we were able to look at the information ahead of time, would do a little research and come with some information about some of the psychotropic medications that people were being prescribed and share his knowledge with us. So having someone who has knowledge about psychotropic medications, it could be a pharmacist, it could be a psychologist, it could be a psychiatrist, it could be a nurse. Um, you know, there are, are many people, um, um, a nurse practitioner, maybe a pharmacy technician, there might be different people who have different uh, levels of knowledge and expertise around um, psychotropic medication. And then it's also helpful when you have people who are comfortable and knowledgeable about best practices in the um, intellectual developmental disabilities field so that they understand. It might even be that there are people on this committee who serve multiple roles because it could be um, a pharmacist who also has um, a family member who has a disability and so um, they're knowledgeable, they're on the board of a of another social service agency. So really thinking about who is it that has best practices um, and knows that and is comfortable in sharing that with folks. You can do things to gain more membership, like looking at um, some of the um, educational system. Perhaps um, students in high school might want to um, come and observe and learn about 
um, a human rights committee. Maybe there are colleges in your area um, where you have social workers or psychologists um, in students, um, theology or philosophy students who might be interested in learning um, and having a real practical experience with supporting people um, with their rights. You can um, also look for members at other social service agencies, and those aren't just um, agencies that support people with disabilities. They can be agencies that support um, people who are disadvantaged and um, maybe um, um, use uh, services, food pantries or um, other social services. Um, they might be um, aging services or just service organizations like um, um, you know, the, uh, some of your community action groups. You might even consider sharing members with other providers, um, thinking about, you know, are there other providers in your area where somebody's willing and able to participate in multiple human rights committee? You really need to make sure that the membership is large enough so that you have enough people that you can ensure you have a quorum. I think it's very difficult when you have a meeting and the people who come, you, you're not able to make decisions because you don't have a quorum. So if you have enough members and, and you define your quorum in such a way, it's much more likely that you'll um, be able to meet that. You might just, um, you know, you, you ask your board members for some favors, and so this might be another opportunity to involve your board members, um, members of your leadership team or other people in your organization to really um, share and recommend one person who's really strong in social justice, who believes in justice, and is a strong advocate in supporting rights for people. might work with community, community religious groups to recruit members. Uh, it might be that there are people um, in, the age, in, um, in that group that you could use some of your own social capital to get membership. You might have, um, you might decide that you have to have more committees. You have to have two committees who meet at different times so you're able to provide effective due process. This is particularly necessary when you, um, when you have a large number of people in your organization that you support or a large number of people um, who have restrictions. And so um, I actually worked um, in a state uh, for a while that had, um, that reviewed all restrictive programs, so all behavior support pro programs that contained restrictions. And they had two different committees that met um, to, um, every month to go over all of the um, programs that were on the schedule. You want to make sure that an agency liaison um, is a very important person. It's somebody who doesn't necessarily serve on the committee, but it's somebody from the agency who's responsible for um, really supporting the function of that human rights committee. Um, when I talk about the Human Rights Committee that I was on a few years ago, there was a really strong um, advocate uh, who really supported us and encouraged us to ask questions and um, would call us afterwards and um, thank us for our participation and um, really did a lot of good things in helping us um, to be good members of the Human Rights Committee. Um, there might be other things that you can do in terms of using Facebook or other social media uh, to recruit members that you haven't thought of before. Um, there may be avenues of, of people out there that, you know, we just haven't used in the past. So the other thing, again, remember we talked about one of the things that happens is sometimes um, the committee doesn't understand its role and responsibility. So if you develop a policy um, or a committee statement that outlines the, the role of the, response of the Human Rights Committee, at the end I'll share um, a resource with you. Uh, it was written many years ago. It's actually, I think, in its fourth edition that Steve Baker and Amy Tabor wrote about Human Rights Committee that is still very relevant and would um, be a good guide to use in writing a policy committee statement. 
you might even think about having the Human Rights Committee um, itself develop a very simple mission and value statement that will really focus it on their role of protecting and promoting people's rights, um, just to, to keep that at the forefront of what they're thinking about. When we talked about um, people not understanding, first it has to be clearly defined, then people have to um, learn about it. And so it's really about having a training curriculum. So you, so you might think about what does the member need based on their background and experience. You also might ask what is it that current Human Rights Committee members might share with you about what might have been helpful to them. So you're continuing to, to develop that training curriculum. So, and I'm sure many of you do this. Uh, you have a core set of things that you want um, your staff or people within your organization to learn about, but then based on people's previous background and experience, there might be more things that you would want or you might skip over some of the things. You might even include some of the Human Rights Committee members in sharing their expertise around things like um, rights or advocacy or psychotropic medications. You really want to make sure you have a pretty simple definition of due process and what that looks like. And for me, one of the things that I think that's key to this is that it's really about someone, an impartial group of people hearing from the professionals and from the person or who's, who's um, there, whose rights may be limited, and then thinking about, you know, does what how does that work and making sure that the person feels very listened to. So a description of due process. What does that mean that there has to be certain things? And we'll get into some of that when we get into some of the questions in a few minutes. You want to make sure that people know their roles. And there are sometimes, like I've mentioned, you'll have people who have certain expertise. You might have an attorney, a human rights advocate, a, a, a pharmacist, or someone who has expertise in psychotropic medication. And they might have an additional role of sharing some information with their committee members. You might have somebody who's been on the committee for a long time, and they have a great historical um, perspective. And they might talk about, well, we you know, one time that happened and this is kind of what, what we found and this is what we recommended and this is how it worked. And so, you know, what's the role of each individual committee member, again, around the shared and some of the individual things? What's the responsibility of the Human Rights Committee? You know, we talked about the responsibilities are around making sure that they are actively promoting and protecting people's rights and that they're serving as an advisory to the executive director and to the organization. So let's talk a little bit more about the role. So really, again, talking about making sure protecting people's rights and ensuring that rights are not ignored or infringed upon. And so, um, you know, this is particularly important when we think about those rights that are put in place when people share living arrangements with other folks who um, perhaps have behaviors or um, have, you know, um, issues with certain things. And so making sure that the people with whom they share their house with are not ignored, their living arrangement. So I remember very clearly doing a personal outcome measure interview with a woman who um, was very skilled. And, um, and I say that because she could actually cook and she was um, a Vietnamese um, heritage and she would prepare um, some pretty complicated Vietnamese food um, that other people in the house didn't know how to prepare, or her staff. Um, and yet she lived with somebody who, because of certain behaviors, couldn't have knives or forks or any kinds of um, eating utensils. And so they were typically locked in the drawer. And I remember her very um, 
shyly and very um, reservedly saying, yeah, and sometimes the staff forget that and so they don't give us anything and they go out of the room and the only thing we have to eat our meals with are our fingers. Um, and so, you know, really making sure that um, there are strategies in place um, to protect and ensure rights and that they're not ignored. And the same kind of thing happens with house rules sometimes. Making sure that we respect individual preferences. And so again, there might be some of you who are prescribed medication um, and you'd rather not take medication. You'd rather change your lifestyle and eat differently and exercise differently. And then there are other people who in the same circumstance, if there's a pill that'll fix it, let me just take the pill. And so what are each person's individual preferences? Um, making sure that the Human Rights Committee knows how their role, what their role is, and how that supports the mission and vision of an organization. And again, I believe that many of you that are on this call are, are uh, members of organizations that are, have a person-centered culture or are striving to have a person-centered culture. And so how, what's the role of the Human Rights Committee in that? Um, making sure that there are positive approaches whenever there's restrictions in place so that people are learning responsibilities that go with exercising rights, but also so that their right is restored. Making sure there are options beyond your traditional behavior modification. So it might be around relaxation, it might be around yoga, it might be around um, some other kinds of things. There's um, um, something that I've just recently be, been reading about called tapping that's kind of um, a way to redirect your focus from whatever's going on to, to tapping. Um, so looking at that, it might be, you know, keeping a list of what are some of the things that you're seeing that are impacting people's rights. Understanding the difference between rights and privileges. And so, um, you know, sometimes we think about the right to free association, the right to contact with um, family and friends, and then we think, are those privileges? And so making sure that, that there's a difference, that we're not talking about limit, limiting people's contact with their natural support network as, um, and thinking that contact with a natural support network is really a privilege. It, you know, when it's a right. And again, looking at that on a person by person basis. We want to make sure that the, the committee uh, understands and presumes competence that, that, that it doesn't default to, oh, it's probably safer that way. And so um, I don't know about you, but there are some things that I have done in my life, including, um, you know, um, burning myself with my flat iron. And I think, you know, um, if I had to demonstrate competence with a flat iron before I could um, use one again, would I ever get to use a flat iron again? And so presuming competence and not taking away that right or not letting me use something because I have to demonstrate that it's um, safe before um, and I know how to use it before I can do it. The responsibility includes making sure that there's due process for every and all rights restrictions. And that could be something as, as um, from limiting people's access to their personal property, their money, um, or it could be more res restrictive or intrusive interventions like, um, you know, um, um, not being able to um, ride their bike to the grocery store, those kinds of things. To be um, really strong advocates for really decreasing the use of restrictions and focusing um, on the person more than the organization. And I think that's a real tricky one. Um, the org th th this Human Rights Committee is really focused on people and not protecting the organization. They're really focused on um, the rights of people that are supported by the organization. It's to engage in problem solving that will help to reduce and avoid restrictions and really help people to actively support their rights. 
um, it's also necessary for them to look at substantiated allegations of mistreatment, exploitation, abuse, and neglect, because so many of those impact people's rights and the right to be free of abuse and neglect, coercion and restraint is also a very important right that's protected for people, all people. It's really about promoting confidentiality and making sure there's informed consent. And so some of the questions that people might be asking on the committee around informed consent is, how was it explained to the person? Um, I don't know how many of you were on Facebook, but a few months ago, I had a friend who was going through surgery and she went to the, um, for intake and they said, how would you like to receive this information? Would you like it to be um, in writing? Would you like it to be read to you? Would you like a demonstration of it? Or a combination of those things? Thinking about, you know, what is the best way for people to get information so they can make informed choices? During the meetings, What's really important is that you have meetings at times and in places where people, where the majority of members can attend. That might mean that you have them outside of traditional business hours. And so they're in the evening um, and maybe they're not at seven o'clock, maybe they're at 530 so people can come on their way home from work. Um, you might think about particularly in larger or more um, busy um, urban areas, you might rotate the location of the meeting instead of somebody only having 15 minutes every time to go to the meeting and somebody else having an hour and a half, maybe you move the meeting around so that people have, um, are people that have an hour and a half sometimes only have a short time. And then, you know, when you're when people's restrictions are being reviewed and they're coming to the Human Rights Committee, taking time ahead of time to sit down with them and explain what the Human Rights Committee does, what, what's going to be presented, what their opportunity is to talk to the members of the committee and share what they think and, and feel, and then it really is an opportunity for them to speak their mind. Um, and then make sure that it's accessible, that people have transportation, whether they're members or people whose restrictions are being um, reviewed. Is there a way to help with transportation? Um, you might even think about ride sharing and see if a, another committee uh, member might help with providing transportation. As an organization, rather than having the committee be responsible for taking minutes, meeting minutes, you might do that as a support to them. You also might um, think about, you know, developing a format for your meeting minutes. Um, this, is, um, this is what we just, this is the topic. This is um, the general points of the restriction. This is what the agent, what the committee talked about. These were the recommendations. This is when it comes back, those kinds of things. So that you have a format, so it's easy to, easier to take minutes and, and maybe it's more bullet than it is um, um, a narrative. You might support the committee in developing a checklist of those questions that they must ask to help ensure due process takes place and avoid rubber stamping. We're gonna to get to um, some sample questions in a few minutes, but my suspicion is that um, many of you already have some, some good questions and might, might think about it. And then making sure that um, you have a way to support them in, in making sure that they close the loop so there's follow-up for their requests and recommendations. And that might be done through um, that liaison or through that person who's taking minutes. So here are some questions. So remember we talked earlier about making sure that we ask the why question. So why is this restriction necessary? What else has been tried? What happened? What kind of opportunity for training or learning new skills has been provided? 
did we rule out any other causes that might be contributing to this? I, you know, I know sometimes we, we um, have to step back and look at patterns and somebody's behavior changes. We have to think about what in, is there something medical or is there something that's happened um, externally that's caused that? Um, um, or maybe it's even been some trauma or abuse that's happened. What teaching strategies are being used to help people restore those rights? And are these the same limitations that you would see for people without disabilities? And I have a, a niece who a number of years ago um, was really having some difficulty after she got out of high school and started working, having some difficulty managing her money. And she was um, overdrafting her um, debt with her debit card and her checks. And so she asked for some support. And so, um, you know, we, we talked about it. We put in a budget into place. She um, didn't carry her debit card with her. She didn't carry her checks with her. Um, she'd sometimes blame things on me because she'd say, well, I can't go because I don't have any money and I don't want to have to tell Kathy about it. And so, you know, are these the same limitations? Now, I do have to tell you that at any point, if Jennifer would have said, I want my money back, her checkbook back, her debit card back, um, they would have been handed it back to her. So again, the same, same rights, the same limitations. Um, and I'm happy to say that she's successfully managing her money now many years later and doing a great job. Um, okay. So um, what criteria has been put in place to, to look at um, as the time to remo remove those restrictions? What data? We've talked about informed consent. Is it there? Who gave it? And was it truly informed? And how did the, how did the, the person learn about? Who explained it to them? How did they explain it to them? And, um, you know, we do many, many focus groups with people. And um, during one of our basic assurances reviews, um, it, focus groups during a basic assurance accreditation, um, we, um, Nancy said, what's important to me is that they give that right right back. And so, again, you know, what's the criteria and does it follow that guideline of give that right right back if you take it away. All right. So, an effective um, and progressive committee really has a, a good culture of team. And they really remind themselves on a regular basis um, that they are responsible for the quality of life for people and that they have a role in the agency's mission. They think about it in terms of if this was me, if this was my daughter, if this was my son, my niece, my brother, my neighbor, what would you want, would that, would you, what they want, would that be acceptable to them? If there's a restriction in place, would that be acceptable if it were somebody that you cared about, you had a relationship with? So, you know, just again, that whole culture of alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. So when you develop that culture, it's an, it's, it's an opportunity for that group, for that agency to really have another way that makes sure that people are treated fairly, that they're treated with respect, and that we didn't, the organization didn't miss anything. You have to occasionally remind members that their opinion, their thoughts, their beliefs are valued that certainly psychiatrists, doctors, behaviorists, the organizational staff know many things, but they don't know everything, and that everyone's opinion, everyone's thoughts are valued equally. So some of the things that we see that really help is when you recognize members for their contribution, that you, um, you, you, give them those personal phone calls, you thank them for coming, um, you um, uh, recognize important events, 
anniversaries, a year, two years, three years, five years. Um, and then um, think about sharing successes. So making sure that the committee knows that as part of their work, this many people's rights were restored. During the last six months, there's been a, a successful de decrease in the use of psychotropic medication for five people. Share success stories. So sometimes, you know, the Human Rights Committee hears about this person and, and, the, and the problems they're having. Well, you know, years later, um, if their person's life is good, make sure you share those and share those little successes. It's that, you know, recognizing and that helps um, members of the Human Rights Committee feel like what they're doing matters. They get feedback. So some of the things that we've noticed when we see the best of the best, and we do, um, is that um, people in our focus groups, and when we talk to them, they tell us where we do go to the Human Rights Committee, and we do talk, and they listen to me, and they make me feel welcome. Um, that members of the committee are invited to come by and see people and meet people and um, spend time in people's homes, um, either to celebrate um, rights um, restorations or to promote and recognize restrictions across the organization. That members are really um, willing to think about what are the other ways we can be doing, what else can we do? What are the questions? What, what's another good thing we can add to our list? So when we talk about making that list of questions, it's not, it's not a static list. It can be a list that, that people change based on what you learn as a shared group. We see that organizations who um, express appreciation with a, sometimes just a simple appreciation luncheon or dinner um, is a good sign that it's a good human rights committee and a good person-centered, um, have a, an organization with a good person-centered culture. That um, when people are supported to initiate things to be, to be taken to the human rights committee, or if something comes up and, it's, and they don't initiate it, but they're still supported to go and, and take that, those issues to the human committees, human rights committee that go beyond restrictions. So here's the, the first is um, on this resource is um, the book that I mentioned and then there are other things by CQL and the human um, and the Declaration of Human Rights and um, Mike we do have a little bit of time for questions. I was trying to make sure I got to the materials because I knew there would be some questions. Okay, well, we have a great group here, Kathy, and we have lots of questions. Perfect. <laughs> so, all right. Um, how do you propose ensuring confidentiality when there are persons who receive services also serving as a member of the Again, I think that, that um, it's a matter of really looking at how you teach that um, and how you share that and making sure that the people that are on the committee um, do that. I, I'll tell you a funny story about um, doing a review one time, um, an accreditation review, um, and this person was on the Human Rights Committee, and I went to talk to her, and she said, I can't tell you that. It's all confidential. So it, it certainly does happen that people are able to understand that, and um, again, it's, it's about making sure that you just explain it and get their um, get them to um, agree to it. Um, okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned that committees approve restrictions. Should it be the role of a human rights committee to approve the restrictions or should it be to ensure that the person's rights are being protected if the right is going to be limited? I, I think, I guess I, in many ways I see those as the same kind of um, Thing, the approving the restriction is saying that all of those things that needed to happen are happening and that the person's rights are protected. Does yeah, that I'll, make you know, sense? I'll, just, uh, I'll add to that too, you know, human rights committees should really be approaching the 
restrictions from the from the point of rights uh, rather than the standpoint of um, being clinical. So kind of a different approach. Um, but yeah, human rights committees definitely want to look at uh, the fairness and ensure proper review rather than looking at it from a clinical perspective. Correct. Correct. Thank you, Mike. Okay. How do you handle the situation where everyone who lives in the home has a restriction and the team deems it as a non-issue? Should these still be taken through and how should this be recorded? And so we did have a couple other questions right along this same realm. Um, so that's restrictions for people that are it's not their restriction, it's somebody else's restriction in the home, but it affects. So, so um, if I'm understanding, you're asking, so in some places there are some rules or some, um, some guidelines that um, people don't object to as um, in terms of a rights limitation, and so should those be reviewed? And then the other question is when, um, I share a home with someone who has rights limitations and that affects mine. Should that be reviewed? Is that what you're, is that the question? Did yeah, I, we, we had a few questions uh, right along those same lines. So okay. rights restrictions that affect other people. So, you, you know, um, all rights, uh, all rights restriction, any rights restriction should be reviewed. Um, and, and when, when um, the Human Rights Committee is looking at that, one of the things they're looking at is, is there a way, I mean, is there a way for the person to, um, to say no? I mean, can they say no? Do they know they can say no? So is there really informed consent? So that would be one of the things that, that I would think the agency would want to look at is when they say it's a, you know, it's not an issue. It's a, you know, it doesn't seem to bother anybody or they say it doesn't bother them. Do they know there are other options? And so have they given informed um, consent to that? And um, what are, again, the teaching strategies that are in place to reduce that restriction, whether it's um, in place or not. So, um, and then when, and the same would be true of, for example, the person I spoke about who lived with the person who couldn't have access to knives or forks. Um, it was certainly a restriction that had a negative impact on her. Um, and it didn't affect her rights. And so generally speaking, we're looking at any and all rights limitations being reviewed by the committee. That said, there may be some that um, are um, reviewed less frequently. Um, it doesn't necessarily, um, there was a periodic review and so you might look at those kinds of things. Um, what are the ways when it when it's not doesn't seem to be an issue for the person? Um, and I would always make sure every restriction is reviewed for each person and not by each group of persons. So if you have a group of people who are in a day program together, or a group of people who ride a van together, or a group of people who live together, that any restrictions that impacts each of them would be reviewed on an individual basis, not as a group limitation. Okay, Bye. thank you. Yeah. Would you uh, add anything? Uh, no, I think you. I think you summed it up. Uh, somebody else did add in the chat box that uh, it, it sounds like her organization is doing some. So anytime they have a rights restriction that affects the people, everybody gets informed consent. And I, I would certainly agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, describe how a support coordination organization that is not funded through HCBS would establish its committee, i.e. what is this entity's role? Restrictions are applied while the person receiving services from direct support providers not the support coordination agency. So it's unclear of the entity's authority. So, um, and, and we sometimes run into organizations who support people who have um, limitations and are supported by multiple agencies. And so I think it's a, it's a collaboration um, and so whether that support coordination agency has all has its own separate committee or whether or not 
they just get the information from the supporting agencies. I think it's, you know, it's about collaborating and focusing on that individual person and what works best for them. If there's disagreement, then they may want to form their own committee so that they can take forward any disagreements between what the, what the team, if there are disagreements between teams of people that are, are in different agencies. So, um, so it's, it, it's not required, it, there has to be due process. And whether or not that happens through the organization that provides my residential supports, the organization who provides my day supports, or the organization who provides my service coordination, it doesn't matter as long as those groups of people are working together to support me to promote my rights. Does that make sense? It does, and I, I would just add to that the Human Rights Committee may serve other functions as well, such as policy review and promoting rights in general for everybody that receives supports for from the organization. So, and, and I know this is a very um, relevant question as more and more states move towards conflict-free case management. Those case management agencies may not be implementing restrictions on their own, but they still want to be promoting rights. Correct. That's a great point, Mike. Okay, so should the HRC meetings always be held in person or could they be held over a telephone conference? Um, I think in this age where we're talking about technology and we're doing um, interrated reliability by Skype and we're doing webinars and sharing information, I think if it works for you to do them, um, using some kind of technology, although I will personally say that I think it's much better if you can use a different platform than just a um, telephone call. I think sometimes that you don't get as much feedback from people um, as if you use um, a, a Skype or something that's a little bit more visual. Agreed. I know where I live is very rural, so you know, I can see that making sense for people. Um, okay, so is it a rule that a person cannot sit on the HRC committee at an agency if they are employed by another similar agency? I am not aware of any such rule. It certainly um, is not part of the basic assurances, or, um, but is there, an, is there a, a a law or a rule that's in an individual state, I wouldn't to know that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not aware of any state statues uh, against that, but uh, that's not saying that they don't need to. Right. That's definitely not our rule. <laughs> right, we didn't even stay in a Holiday Inn last night. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, let's see. Uh, okay, can you give examples of what a privilege is versus a right? So, um, you know, a privilege might be um, going out to specific kinds of things that they want to do, uh, but not, go, not being able to go out would, would limit people's freedom to leave their home. Um, a privilege might be um, having, um, um, you know, I, I'm thinking about different things that happen in my own family. A privilege might be that... Um, having a um, cake for dessert um, instead of fruit uh, might be, you know, those kinds of things. But it, again, it would be on a very individual basis and something that um, you would need to look at um, and what are the differences. In general, privileges are not entitlements, rights are entitlements. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we would appreciate suggestions on increasing active participation of people receiving services on the committee. So how, how do we entice people receiving services to want to serve? So again, I think that, I mean, you know, that is um, so much of an individual basis. Some of the things that I've seen that are successful are when um, there's enough support provided prior to the meeting that they feel like they're making a, a good contribution. 
Um, and so it requires meeting with the person maybe going over. Um, sometimes people we support uh, may not be able to read as well as other people on the committee and or may not um, be able to read the names of psychotropic medications. Many of us can't do that. And so finding those supports and putting in supports in place for them to practice um, and, and really do those kinds of things. And um, I think the same things are true, you know, recognizing them for their contributions, um, whether they have a disability or not, you know, having those luncheons, um, celebrating their anniversaries, sharing those success stories and making them see um, the benefit. The, the real barrier that I have seen is when people on the committee um, who are receiving services don't have the supports ahead of time um, or afterwards to kind of figure out what happened and what, what maybe what they could have done differently. So maybe some mentoring and coaching. Um, Mike, have you seen anything else? Yeah, well, I, I would just say, you know, make sure that uh, I, I, I tend to think that what works for people receiving services tends to be the thing that works for everybody else. So let's make sure that the meetings happen at a time that's convenient for everybody, that, uh, that, that is more likely um, that, that people will want to attend. Um, I think, uh, you know, having, having donuts there is a, is a good idea too. <laughs> yep, that's always a good idea. But I, again, I agree with you. I think it's the same for whether or not we are or not. Um, and, um, you know, and I think, you know, one of the ideas that people are participating and they're not there because they're in trouble or they are, um, um, you know, going to be in trouble or get anyone in trouble. Absolutely. All right. So uh, what are your recommendations regarding safely and responsibly Fading out interventions which have enabled a person to be successful at day program and also ensured the safety and rights of others. My agency supports a person who has demonstrated behavior of a sexual nature across a variety of settings, which had he not been identified as a person with a developmental disability would have resulted in legal entanglements and possibly incarceration. At day program, he is accompanied throughout the building by a staff member. He likes the company and has no problem with it, but also understands the why as to why this occurs. This intervention has allowed the person to remain at day program and to succeed. It also ensures that others remain safe. The data over several consecutive review periods would indicate that no sexual impropriety has occurred, but it is precisely because of the protections we have put in place. Uh, so more, more, of a, yeah, more of a statement here than a question. Right. And I, and I think, again, every, all of those things are on an individual basis, and it's based on what the person wants and needs. I think that um, some of the things that, you know, can you fade out the support at times where the, where the risk is less? So, um, you know, maybe having the person further away or, um, you know, doing some different things. But again, you know, you, you, you're right. You don't want to put the person at risk of offending in such a way that it creates trauma for him or for anyone else. And so you want to do it very carefully. But, um, you know, if there are for example, I, I have known people in the past where there have been um, um, someone who there's a private restroom and so they don't really need somebody to be in the restroom with them as long as it's empty before they go in there and so they could have their private time in the bathroom without staff so are there those opportunities to um to to fade that out in a way that minimizes risk um, again you know what you know you, you're talking sometimes about high risk low occurrence behaviors and so um, you know you, you need to to think carefully about that so that you don't um, 
put the risk up of the person having an incident that causes trauma to himself or to other people. Um, so I don't know if I successfully skirted that one or not, but it's on a person by person basis. And looking at what those opportunities, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, following up on the earlier slide regarding the federal HCBS settings final rule, in Colorado, we have determined that the rule doesn't alter the scope of what goes before the HRC. If a matter historically went before the HRC, it still should. If it didn't, it still shouldn't. Are other states taking a different approach? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. That might be a good one for you to reach out to um, the National Association of State Developmental Directors. They have a listserv that allows you to ask those kinds of questions. And so that might be a good place for you to ask that question. Or if you wanted to send me an email, I'll reach out and see if I can find any any place that that's changed it. Um, I, I would agree with you that um, the the rule did not redefine anything that shouldn't have already been happening in terms of people's rights. I would agree with that as well. Okay, so with people with legal guardians, should we discuss informed consent with the adjudicated person or as well as the legal guardian. So when people have guardians who does informed consent get discussed with both. Yes. Okay, that was a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, regarding confidentiality, do you re recommend that when committees are reviewing a limitation of a person's rights, that all identifying information about the person be removed from any documentation that is given to the committee? Um, you know, that tip that does frequently happen. Um, that doesn't mean that people don't know who it is. Um, but I, it, it does frequently happen so that there's not any information um, that's clear. But, um, you know, so, so it is a good practice if you can remove information and only give, share the information that's needed for them to review. I think that's um, a good best practice. Okay, great. And, uh, you know, and I, I would just add to Kathy, I think, um, for all people that serve on the committees, uh, you know, the expectation is confidence. Right, right. Okay. And you should have uh, a confidentiality agreement and people should right. um, recognize that and sign that. Good point. All right. Uh, so uh, looking for resources on educating human rights committee members. What, what are some good resources for education? So, um, again, I would go back to the resources that I shared. Um, I think the Human Rights Committee is good. I think the All About Rights Guide is also a good um, guide to, it's written in um, pretty easily. Um, I think the Basic Assurances is good in terms of helping people to see some um, different ideas. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you are on Facebook, but you, you know, certainly could ask on Facebook um, if there are agencies who have developed good um, training curriculum that they'd be willing to share with you. Uh, Mike, do you know of anybody or would point them in a direction if they contacted you? Oh, well, you know, I think this webinar would be a good resource. Um, <laughs> and maybe we could uh, address that now to Kathy, the um, the webinar, the video, and the slides, the participants will get a link to that, right? Right, um, probably in two there. to three weeks, yes. Okay, yeah, this, this you know, this webinar was, was certainly uh, helpful to me, so I know that it could be a lot, a lot of good information here. And I, di I did get a couple of emails from people who were having members of their Human Rights Committee um, participate in this, in this training, so I think that is, you're right, that, Mike, that's a good idea. Okay, uh, we support people who are their own guardians and who choose to still have restrictions. They have at other points been on formal and informal programs to lessen restrictions, but they still choose to keep that restriction. How would you recommend proceeding? Would this be rationale enough to keep a restriction? You know, you'd, ha you'd have to look at informed consent and do they understand that they could give that um, up that they, they can make that choice at any point. Um, and if they decided that um, they wanted that right back, 
what would it take to get them back? Is that all they have to do is say, I want it back and it's done? Or does it go through some kind of appeal process or discussion? Then it's probably still a restriction. Does that make sense? So if the litmus test is, if I change my mind tomorrow, it goes away. To if I change my mind tomorrow and we have to have a team meeting, we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do this, then it's probably a rights restriction. Okay, I have a question right along those same lines. So after explaining the concerns to the person who may have a right restricted, what happens if the person does not agree? Um, then the organization has to make a choice about what, you know, what the other options are and look at those. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult situation sometimes if you don't feel like you can support them safely. Um, but there are, um, um, you know, the person should be able to refuse. I mean, that's part of the thing, you know, um, it might require more discussion uh, and, and discussion about the consequences, or it might, um, you know, require us to be more creative about what else we can do. Yeah, I would just add, you know, so we're, we're talking about the concept of due process. And so due process in of, of any form, I mean, you know, sometimes that's done by the courts. And, uh, and the idea is that due process um, is, is a way to make sure that uh, whatever it is, is being done fairly. Okay, um, so uh, you got time for a couple more, Kathy? Um, well, we are over our time, but if there's just a couple more, we could do a couple more. Uh, my, my definition of, uh, I'm using that term loosely. It's more than a couple. <laughs> oh. Um, uh, perhaps what we could do is look at the questions, Mike, and send those out in the email that we send out. Um, so people, um, you know, we can answer the questions in an email. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we have, uh. Quite a few more. Okay, and um, I do see, I, I wanted to share this because um, Bill Simpson, I'm not sure what's, oh, he's in South Carolina, and um, he has shared a resource. Um, so I am going to paste it into the chat box. Um, the, um, he's developed a human rights committee training for their state and he's happy to share it and so he is in South Carolina I just put that in the chat box um, so if you want to copy that down you can otherwise I can also um, um, put that in the um, in the email that goes out Okay, and so even if you didn't register ahead of time, it looks like somebody joined later on, uh, will they still get the email? You know if that'll still happen? Um, I believe so, but even if they don't get the email, if they don't get the email um, in two to three weeks, they can let me know and I can forward it to them. Okay, great. So my email address is... Um, on here at c yadamick at the council.org so thank you all very much for um, participating i'll look at those questions and um, provide some information um, in the in the what we send out to you thank you all very much for participating and um, we'll have another webinar soon i'm sure Enjoy the rest of your day.